Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today was scheduled on the show previously when I had a week of all the wonderful doctors from Plant-Based Telehealth, and she couldn't make it for some reason. So we had another one of their wonderful doctors, but we need to meet her because she's one of the team at Plant-Based Telehealth. And her name is Dr. Elizabeth Fontaine, and she specializes in OBGYN, and I'm very excited to get to know her. Please welcome her to the show. Well, you're definitely worth the wait. Well, I mean, I had a good reason. And so not only OBGYN, but I'm also a board certified in lifestyle medicine. And, uh, you know, when you met all these amazing physicians, uh, it was the Canadian Thanksgiving. So, you know, now we're able to cross the borders. So I went to see my whole family that I haven't seen and spoke French, you know, so. That's there so you cool. It. One of my yeah. favorite chefs is French Canadian chef, Eric Le Chasseur. So, no, I, I completely understand. And that's fine because we got to meet another one of the, the doctors. So how did you get hooked up with plant-based telehealth? Oh, actually, you know, I'm a little bit older than the majority of them. So uh, when COVID hit, it's actually interesting because I was, uh, I had decided that that was going to stop working at the uh, institution I was, and uh, just happened at the same time of COVID. And, um, you know, I started a business with a partner where I coach physician and healthcare um, uh, executive. So I'm a coach, uh, you know, with the International Coaching Federation. And I miss a little bit of what I was doing as a physician. So I say, listen, there has to be something now that COVID has hit and we do a lot of uh, our um, presentation like we're doing today. Zoom, webinar, uh, everything is virtual. So this is how I found uh, Laurie Marbris. And uh, I was probably one of the first one that kind of joined the group, uh, which we are nine now. So you've met them all. So this is how it happened. So for the last year, kind of regroup all these amazing people. And now we're nine physicians. Most of them are primary care physician. I'm the only one that has a specialty uh, above and beyond that doesn't make big difference, but it's just the way it is. Well, that's fantastic. But when did you become plant-based? I'd love to hear that story. So actually, you know what, as an OBGYN, so my background prior to medical school, I, um, I studied what you call here kinesiology. And after kinesiology, I did a master's degree in obesity and exercise physiology. So it's always been an and integrated in my practice to help my, you know, patient to stay healthy. And while my patients were getting a little bit older, you know, they were starting to question a lot of, you know, how can I do this? And uh, so I joined actually, interestingly, what we call at the time, the, well, it still exists, the A4M is the anti-aging uh, group, which is a big group, actually, of physician. And um, just to learn, uh, there's a lot of foundational, uh, very interesting, but they were removing medication to put for people a lot on a bunch of supplement. And I say, you know what, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't fit with my philosophy, nothing against them. And I researched and found the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Now at that time, I've been with the American College for, hmm, I would say a good, uh, you know, since the beginning, At the time we were about 200 physicians in the conference. Now we're five, 7,000. So it's growing uh, exponentially. And uh, this is how a physician like me learned that uh, there's a little bit more nutrition that I was not aware. So I met, uh, you know, Dean Ornish uh, and uh, Caldwell Assistant and all their research. And I was at awe. Uh, to discover to wait a minute, you know, this, this is, it's not just not eating junk food. <laughs> it's actually most of what I ate was still not good for me. So therefore, um, this is why I uh, kind of start. Actually, what I did is when I came back to my small community, I challenged a group of 15 of my patients to uh, go for a three weeks challenge on a plant-based diet to demonstrate the result. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, I'm sure that you've seen a lot of people that demonstrate result. But in my tiny little community, this was during Thanksgiving, everybody wanted to kill me. I kind of succeed to convince them just to go on the whole plant-based diet for three weeks. 
and demonstrate the amazing results, lowering cholesterol, moving weight down, diabetes. So it was kind of interesting. So I came home and being uh, this, the decision of uh, at the time to become a plant-based, which I influenced my family. So, you know, most of them, I'd say uh, 90% plant-based. There's only one that is fully plant-based. My husband is usually pretty good, but uh, so I'm the, I'm the one that is plant-based. That's how the story unfold. How long ago was that? Uh, so it was around two, 2012. So it's been almost 10 years. That's fantastic. Have you noticed any changes in, your, in, in yourself? Well, you know, I have to admit prior to that, I wouldn't say that I was an unhealthy individual. I was obviously eating still some meat, but not much. Um, so I was already kind of borderline vegetarian and I was uh, very active physically. So I was very careful. Um, so, you know, when you start pretty young to try and that's why I want people to understand that prevention. When you started very uh, young, you know, could make a significant difference. But I mean, you know, going in a plant base, you you feel always the energy, you know. And my numbers on cholesterol that were not excessively high drop again significantly. So my numbers are still even better than a lot of uh, people that I um, have the chance to help. So yeah. You said, you mentioned you had something like a certificate or some special training in obesity. Well, after I did my kinesiology, which is, you know, uh, like a three years degree, I decided to do some research with a, and at the time it was kind of interesting because I worked with uh, somebody who worked not uh, with uh, overfeeding. You know, some of the study of overfeeding started in Vermont. So now I'm in Vermont. So I, I studied uh, into, did a master's degree in researching obesity and the impact of exercise. So I did exercise physiology as well. So we had the chance to uh, work a lot into uh, like my master. What I did was genetic too. So there was a lot of component into that. So my master's degree was to train. 20 sets of identical and non-identical twins for 20 weeks and show the difference between non-identical and identical. So it was interesting, nothing based on food at the time. But when you think about it, in those days, we had 10% of obesity and we thought this was high. And then I moved to the United States to start my practice. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, I wanted to go in sports medicine. I've changed my mind because I said, this, this is not what I want to do. And I didn't know at the time that if we had lifestyle, it probably would have been something that I would be very interested in. So when I moved to the United States, then, then you see all this progression. And if we even have the time to show some of my slides, you can see how much the obesity and overweight had taken over. And, and unfortunately, with that, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, correlation or association with chronic disease that we are unfortunately overwhelmed. So that's, that's the importance of being able to say, you know, what is it that we can do with prevention? You know, exercise is good, but uh, what we put in our mouth, you know, it's very, uh, it's so significant, but a, an important impact. And you know, you know well too. So there wasn't any talk about diet or plant-based diet then? When I was doing my research at the beginning, not at all, not at all. What we, we did, like I, I mentioned it a little bit, what we were doing is the impact on identical twins if we were to overfeed them. So we were giving them more calories to see how much they would react genetically speaking. We never assume at the time that the lifestyle would have such an impact. We thought it was genetic. So you see how... Uh, a little bit of that uh, difference that we were not aware, you know, and, and people were doing good on exercise because we thought exercise, you know, would probably help in the genetic, but we never add the um, importance of the uh, diet, what you put in your mouth and the plant base would have such an impact. So me, it's with time that I've learned and most likely because of my patient, my patient were requesting. So I have, and, and I'm somebody who loves researching. And I said, yeah, there's something that I can, I, you know, that I can offer to my patient. And that's how I lived with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and the impact of uh, a plant-based diet. 
That's amazing. And so that's when you decided to get board certified in lifestyle medicine. Well, I mean, it took a while, you know, to, uh, so they were just building and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine was very early. They were still with the American College of Preventive Medicine. So when they were able to, you know, demonstrate their credentials, so the board certification only started in 2017. So I was part of the first group that became board certified. And now it's almost six, 700 people uh, every year and it's all over the planet. So it's not just the United States. Now these exams exist in Australia and, uh, you know, uh, Singapore, uh, France, uh, UK, same exam. This, this is uh, it's probably the only uh, specialty that you can regroup all these physicians, or not just physician. There's a lot of um, you know provider that could be a nurse, dietitian, uh, chiropractor, pharmacists that are um, becoming um, specialized in lifestyle medicine. So the impact is starting. We're really starting to see the uh, impact of not only the provider that are interested to know more, but being able to see all these people that are coming and requesting, okay, wait a minute here, I want to know more. So that's why the uh, plan-based telehealth is offering something that to me was just amazing. It's all over. You know, when you think, you know, we're offering all over the United States and we're not limited to United States. I can actually see people from Canada, people that speak French, because I speak French, people from France. Uh, and and that's uh, and that that will become that will be become a standard where people will be requesting to, you know, medicine is still good. I'm not saying that it's it's wrong, but I think that people will still, you know, kind of demand to um, have the chance to see a, a provider that uh, has a better knowledge of uh, uh, plan based and lifestyle. Did you ever hear about a plant-based diet before attending the ACLM conference? Nothing. No, especially not, not in medicine. I was actually lucky because I did my kinesiology and therefore had more nutrition uh, education than the majority of physicians. And you know that the majority of physicians, we really don't have much uh, regarding nutrition at large. You know, that just doesn't even talk about plant-based, but it's changing. We're starting to have some nice, uh, um, you know, university that are interested to uh, some of the education that have been offered free, free this from the American College. So it's it's amazing. That's fantastic. Did, were you ever overweight? Is that why you were interested in obesity? <laughs> no, it's never been. So that's why I say people are looking at me and say, "What's your problem? You've never had any issue." No. I never had, I, I've always been uh, pretty thin. I was a marathon runner. So was, uh, I guess I succeed uh, in to, uh, and, and like I said, I've always been, even if I was not necessarily plant-based, I was uh, to a certain degree, uh, pretty good, not, not inserting too much junk food in my body. So that was helpful. Well, do you think that, that the fact that you're French has anything to do with it? What are the obesity rates like in France now? Have they grown as well? You know, it's everywhere. Everywhere has. Uh, but I think that, you know, when you come in, you can really, like, when I came to Vermont and nothing negative about it, I did see, um, that was almost, uh, what, 30 years ago. Um, I, I saw that there was definitely a, a significant difference in the United States. Uh, but Canada, everywhere, catching up on, on to all this, you know, it's the food industry is invading and it's all around and we're all a um, little bit addicted to all these foods. So it's uh, changing the, um, the philosophy, especially with the younger uh, population. I mean, it's obviously we can reverse um, with people that had been um, on um, an American diet, but I think that re prevention, and that's what we were trying to when we uh, started a lifestyle um, change into Vermont, uh, for the kids, we were fighting childhood obesity. So we start what we call Rise Vermont, which is now all over uh, Vermont to change lifestyle in order to help kids uh, fighting um, obesity. Wow. Well, for the family. Wow. What kind of foods did you grow up eating in France? I was not in France, me. I was, I'm a Canadian. Oh, Canada. Well, I don't know uh, why I think that's right. You said that, but you, your accent, it's so French. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I ate the same thing as French Canadian would eat. It was a tortillard, everything that was 
kind of fatty. You know, remember during Christmas, we would eat the turkey and the torture and uh, lots of uh, potato and, uh, you know, just a, the typical diet, lots of meat. There was a lot of meat and, uh, you know, uh, but, but in my family, I mean, my mother was pretty good, was six, uh, was pretty good at not inserting, um, you know, junk food. So everything was really, we had some, uh, you know, uh, meat and, uh, you know, other, uh, even dessert, everything was homemade, makes a big, big difference. So, you know, it's, uh, um, but, but I can tell you that I'm probably the only one in my family that are plant food based. Everybody had kept uh, their habit uh, to, to what they, and, and that's the difficult part is to be able to uh, challenge uh, the people um, that are a little bit older. Are you able to to put my my yeah, slide? I've got your slides. Okay. I've got I've got your slides. Right. So uh, um, I know, let me let me pull them up and let me do this. Oh, you don't have to put them right now. I I wasn't. Oh sure yeah, no, I I, I I was just waiting for you to tell me. I have it pulled up, and once you're ready, I can just do a screen share. Well, I think it's a uh, you know I wanted to give the chance for uh, your um, people that are watching. This is a presentation that I and I hate usually uh, PowerPoint. But I have to present to a group of physicians in primary care that may not be as familiar with lifestyle. So I have many slides, but I took probably the first seven, eight, just to demonstrate uh, the kind of the, the reason that we need, uh, making the point of why is it important to have lifestyle. Um, so those numbers are good because it allows the population a uh, physician as well not, are not necessarily fully aware of these numbers. So I think that for everybody is good to see it. You're probably going to have to advance when I'll tell yeah. you. Uh, what I'll do is whenever you tell me, I'll advance. If you're ready, Dr. Fontaine, I can put them up right now. Go okay. ahead, Chef right. AG. So, Let's go for it. I'm not the best at this, but I'm going to do my best. And then view, ah. you want slide show. So okay. there we have it. So you'll just tell me when to advance, okay? All right. Well, it won't take too, too long. So like you mentioned, I wanted to give the chance to people to uh, realize what lifestyle medicine can do. So we can uh, prevent, which is probably the most important thing. We can treat and reverse the disease. So you'd be amazed to see that, um, you know, as the best example is people that have diabetes, um, could be taken completely out of their medication and within a pretty short period of time. So this is pretty amazing. But first, let me just show you some numbers that are important for you to know so you can advance the next one. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, there we go. So this is for fun a little bit. So why, why lifestyle medicine now? So you can see that on the left, this is that typical medic, you know, um, medicine, you know, we're sick care, we, we, we have increased all these chronic disease. And unfortunately, we're not ready to make those changes. So let's, let's check it out. Let me just show you some numbers and try to make you uh, capture the picture. So you can go to the next one. So take time to look at this one. Okay, this may seems like an old uh, uh, slide, but you know, it's, it's probably the newest one that we have. It goes to 2015. This is the life expectancy of all these countries versus health expenditure. Now, look at the United States. We are a country in abundance. We have money and we spend a lot of money in healthcare. And unfortunately, uh, we are probably uh, the country that has the lowest life expectancy. So if you compare, we spend four times more money than any of the other country. Canada is not in there, but it's in the middle with kind of New Zealand. I've seen uh, data that shows that. So that doesn't make sense. So we are spending 17% of our gross uh, domestic product and it's chronic disease that are still there. Uh, diabetes, as an example, continue to prevail. So it's important to think about wellness and prevention for the long-term health of the individual. So go with the next one. And so compare those two. So on the left side, what makes us healthy? 
on the right side, what we spend on being healthy. So if you touch the next one, it's gonna circle a little something here. Next. Okay, so look at this one. So you look at the top, access to care is only 10%. So what makes us healthy, only 10%. What has a significant impact is healthy behavior plus environment, 70%. That is major. Touch the next slide, uh, the, ne the next button. And look on the other side. We spend 88% of our medical service that gives on the other side 10%. And how much do we invest in our healthy behavior? 4%. 4%. This doesn't make any sense in the calculation. Those are um, data that come from Trust of America of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So important to, rem to remember, we should be spending a lot more money in prevention. We don't. Next slide. So this one's a little bit busy. I don't want you to recognize everything, but you know, if you look at the problem, six out of 10 Americans have at least one chronic disease. You go lower, 30% of Americans will be diagnosed with cancer. Half of Americans have cardiovascular disease in itself. It's all chronic disease that are substantially increasing. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, stroke, all lifestyle related. The bottom one is even more important. 88 millions of Americans have prediabetes and 90% don't even know it. 34 million of Americans have type two diabetes and the majority of the type two diabetes is related to our lifestyle. And at the bottom, what drives everything that is above is the rate of overweight and obesity. So 72% of American is or overweight or obese. So, so uh, and, and then you know, on the left side, it basically tells the amount of dollar, which eventually it feels that nobody understand when you think that we put 3.3 trillion of dollars every year for diseases that are related to our lifestyle. You know, we gotta, we gotta try to, to, uh, to do better. Next one. So again, this is another way to explain that, you know, on the left, you have all the risk factor. We said it, physical inactivity, smoking, uh, poor diet, excessive alcohol consumption. These risk factor, which is lifestyle related, drives these health condition which account for 80% of the chronic disease. So it's lifestyle again. I'm just showing it again and again, make sure that we don't forget about it. You can go to the next one. And then the most important one that we're always interested, especially here with Chef AG is the diet. Diet is the leading cause of chronic disease and disability. In the past, it was smoking. Or if the diet was caused, it was because people were not eating sufficiently. Now it's overeating and not eating the right thing. Next one. And I think this is gonna be the last one. So a, a study in Mayo had demonstrated that only 3% of Americans live a healthy lifestyle. And that's, that's just counting simple, simple element, like 150 minutes of exercise a week, which is 30 minutes a day, simple. Uh, there's a score there and um, food that may not represent anything to you, but still it just de demonstrate that we're not eating properly and body fat and not smoking. So there's only, you know, the important thing is 3% of Americans live a healthy lifestyle. So again, we're just demonstrating more and more the importance of uh, changing. And I think this is the last one, uh, Chef. You can try it, but I think it is. Oh, yep, that's it. Yeah. So, you know, simple, a uh, few little slides, but, you know, I think it's so important to be able to show people that we spend a lot of money in healthcare and um, we don't spend much into prevention and prevention basically is lifestyle. So it would be so important if we could put a little bit more and hopefully people will, you know, see those number and being a little bit more like, wow, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's important. Yeah. When you transitioned, was it difficult in any way? Um, for the food? Yeah, well, for the you food. know, if you see that, if you know, French Canadian, a little bit like French, the cheese, 
the cheese for me was the biggest, biggest uh, issue because, you know, when you go to France, you have all these amazing cheese. So that's the biggest thing. Eggs. Uh, I wasn't a very big eat, uh, meat eater, so that wasn't too, too tough. Um, and so, so that'd be the biggest thing is definitely the cheese and uh, eggs, because that was the thing that allowed me to, you know, continue and maintain. You know, the, the tough thing also is that somebody like me, who's already uh, low uh, body weight, you know, people would say, well, you got to eat more because, you know, obviously you're not going to make it. So, you know, when you realize that, you know, a whole plant-based diet, you can definitely maintain your uh, protein level. And uh, I may not be the best example because I'm so thin, um, but there's so many people that are um, amazing athletes. You know, Selena Williams is a perfect example of how you can maintain an amazing body mass. Uh, and I often will refer um, um, people to watch the Game Changer so that they see that, you know, it's not just a question of, uh, you know, you know, for me, it was just a, a, my body a stature that was not <laughs> made to be a very, uh, you know, big person. Like I said, it was something that I had done since I was pretty young. So I think to me also, this importance of being uh, to prevent the disease. But you, you probably weren't eating a lot of processed food, I'm guessing. No, I was, uh, I've never been too, too uh, processed, but you know, I was just like anybody else though. And not, nothing better than anybody. I was just, uh, uh, you know, I ate Big Mac like anybody else when I was a teenager, uh, you know, it, it, it exists. And so when I was doing my training, my running, uh, you know, you felt that this was okay to eat junk food and you didn't know, you didn't know any better, you know, drinking uh, soda was just a natural uh, thing. So it's, it's very, uh, compelling when you learn um, the impact and you see the studies because some people, um, some physicians that were a little bit more brilliant than me decide to do those studies and demonstrate the impact. Mm -mm. Well, whenever we have a doctor on, people like to ask questions and we always favor the ones that were submitted. Would you mind answering a few doctor type questions? Yeah, I'm happy. Great. Thank you. The first one is from Julie. Do hair follicles remain sensitive to even low levels of DHT? I have PCOS and periods mm. have normalized on a whole food plant-based diet. However, there is still significant hirsutism. It is slightly improved, but requires face shaving every day. Will that ever resolve? Yeah, once the hair has been touched and, and you know, because of the uh, impact uh, in the past, because the PCOS will, will have this impact of, one of the things that we're going to see of the hair follicle and what we call uh, hirsutism. Once it's there, you really, you know, you, once you, you, you can, when you reverse by eating the whole plant-based diet, you're allowing your body of not making new hair follicle, but the one that are already there, you're going to need to um, use uh, the technique like you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Here's a question on weight loss. I didn't know that you had an interest in that, but I think you could probably answer it. And she asked, what do you recommend to continue past plateaus when it comes to weight maintenance after weight loss? What are your top tips? How many calories can a person usually add back in exercise? I don't think you can ever add calories back in after you lost weight. I mean, that's just my experience of somebody that has maintained a weight loss. Mm -mm. Yeah. So, you know, plateau is not unlikely. It happens quite a bit. So it all depends. You know, it's always nice to be able to talk with people because, uh, you know, it, it, actually that's what it is. Sometimes you, you decrease so much your amount of calories, the body seems to be in the conservative way. Um, so it's very important. What I like to tell people is plateau is normal. And sometimes we really have to be careful and help with uh, changing or the type of physical activity in one week. And the other week, you know, we kind of um, play a little bit more with the food. Sometimes we intercept with intermittent fasting. So you have to be intelligent because your body is a system that is intelligent. And so you have to be able, and, and it's better to do this under a, uh, an in, a, you know, a physician in supervision. Don't play, don't do this at home alone. <laughs> I always say, as in you be careful. That's why I'm I'm happy to help people because I feel very comfortable. Physician, I'm not comfortable also with exercise. So I've been in this 
for you know many years so i'm very happy to be able to help people discussing exercise and what are the other elements that they can do in order to help them to lose weight it's very difficult to discuss like you said to add back uh, calories um you know usually on the plant base we don't even count calories, you know, because what you're eating is dense and it doesn't have a high amount of calories. So I usually won't even, if I'm able to make people to completely transfer, I don't look at the, the um, amount of calories uh, that they're eating. You know, I just want to make sure that they're eating the right, a whole plant-based diet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Here is a question from Ginny. For Dr. Fontaine, is there a non-surgical treatment for a prolapsed bladder? No, that, that's uh, unless, you know, a prolapsed bladder for the majority of people that may not be kind of aware of that. So it's usually, uh, you know, women that had the usually bigger baby, not necessarily all the time, but the majority of the time. And, and it's the portion of the vagina that we can see um, when we do, let's say an exam. So they will, the women will feel that something is bulging like an egg, they will mention into uh, the lower portion. So the majority of the time you're going to need surgery. However, if uh, a person is significantly overweight, uh, by losing the weight, they can improve uh, significantly their, um, their, um, the condition that, uh, you know, is the prolapse. So it's not for everybody. Some will be having the same problem. The other thing that is feasible to do, depending of, and that is easier to do under exam, we can do an insert into the vagina, what we call a pessary. So it's not anything plant-based, but, you know, it's functional for a lot of women. They don't have to have surgery. So it's like a little donut that you insert into the vagina that holds everything. So I'm sorry to have these discussion, but that's, that's the kind of solution. And I had quite a bit of patient that were using that, that would prefer that than having a surgery. So it's a simple little tool, a pessary. Are you still doing these procedures or are you just doing telehealth right now? I'm just doing telehealth. I've, I've given up OB as well as doing uh, GYN uh, as well. But, but I do see a lot, a lot of patients that I see at plant-based health are usually women that have some condition that they want to discuss uh, regarding what you just said, PCOS, helping with heavy bleeding. We know that plant-based health can have a significant impact on helping women, especially around menopause, can have such an impact. Um, so in us, prevention of osteoporosis and, 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 you know, the, the women have a tendency to think that these conditions, you know, I don't need, I, I'm not supposed to see a physician for that, especially plant-based. Well, you know, this, this is what we need to change. Women, it's very important. We can help the transition. We can improve substantially your health. And I'm not just only looking or even all the physician, it's not only looking to improve the condition, it's optimize optimal health so including checking the um you know exercise stress sleep um to make sure that and your numbers obviously your lab numbers to make sure that uh, we help you the best we can great thank you this is a question from monique i've had two rounds of pelvic floor physical therapy have used estrus cream and lubrication and sex sex is still so painful that i don't even want to do it I'm 62 years old, 30 years on a whole food plant-based diet. What are my options? Yeah, on that though, you know, we know with menopause that uh, lack of estrogen will uh, produce into the, um, the, the, what we have in the vagina is not a skin, it's mucosa. And the mucosa needs to have estrogen to remain lubricated. So the plant-based will not make any difference into that. The question here would be, can you use something that can help with lubrification when you are ready for sexual activity? And as an example, it's one of the places I don't mind using oil. <laughs> so uh, coconut oil is fine. And that could be very helpful in preparation. So that makes it easier. And the other thing is, you know, like she mentioned, uh, locally to have to use some uh, estrogen for women that are significantly impact. You can't have sex. Uh, due to the discomfort, due to atrophy. That's something that, you know, sometimes I definitely, and, 
in at large, I think that lots of women have their um, knowledge. Uh, you know, there's so many misinformation regarding hormone. It's probably the worst thing that I can hear. So I said, listen, please come and talk to me so I can help you to make a, a decision. I'm not saying that I'm going to put people on hormone, but I, I want to be able to discuss with them so that they understand what they're doing. What states are you licensed to do the consults in? So I'm licensed in Vermont, Michigan, Florida, and New York. Uh, I also West Virginia and pretty soon Kentucky. So it's smaller states, but uh, the, and, and obviously anywhere else uh, outside of the United States. Hopefully United States eventually will just make it easy for physician to practice in uh, all the state. But it certainly had been a little bit easier during COVID. Um, some states have been uh, amazing to allow us to practice in some sort of an emergency situation uh, where we can do telehealth. So um, those are the uh, those are the one I'm in. Do you ever wish you had known this information sooner when you were in private practice? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. This was it. You know, I, I was mentioning to you. When I decided to go in medicine, I thought I was going to go in sports medicine, but it really didn't wasn't what I was interested. What I was interested, I didn't know exist in the future. It was lifestyle. That was definitely what I would have liked. Absolutely, absolutely. Such a, and, and hopefully I can influence more um, physician to understand the importance uh, and being able to help them. You know, can't, can't imagine how much work these uh, primary care physicians have to do with, unfortunately, uh, people that are coming with multiple chronic condition. Um, and, and that's why I'm a coach for the physician. They're burned out. And they're, they're burned out because they didn't sign up to take care of uh, us with multiple chronic disease. So it's a uh, prevention, helping to decrease that will have a huge impact on our doctor as well. So, yes, I wish I had known all this a long time ago. Hmm. There's a question from a live viewer about symptoms of menopause and can the whole food plant based diet or any certain foods or any other things help? Absolutely. There's uh, actually, we didn't have many studies yet until Dr. Neil Berner from the uh, PCRM had published in Menopause uh, recently an article where they studied a uh, group of, this is uh, uh, with a control group, which didn't have anything. The other group uh, was whole plant based and add a half a cup of soybean that were cooked. And after 12 weeks, there was a significant uh, decrease of their hot flashes, almost 70 to 80%. So that, that is significant. So you don't have to necessarily think first line, I'm gonna go into onto hormones. You have to think that it's not every woman that will be uh, symptomatic of uh, hot flashes, uh, but the one that are symptomatic, eventually 50% will substantially improve within the first five years, but there's still going to be women that will be symptomatic after that. So you can help substantially by going on a whole plant-based diet. So absolutely, yes. Fantastic. Lisa says, can it even help reverse arthritis? It does have an impact on autoimmune disease. I think you've had uh, many of our... Uh, Physician on plant-based telehealth that are uh, substantially working uh, with uh, autoimmune disease and arthritis is an autoimmune disease and its relationship with inflammation is huge. And we know that plant-based uh, diet is an anti-inflammatory um, diet. And therefore, yes, it does have a huge impact on arthritis. Wow. What about, you know, I mean, is uh, is our hot flashes and these horrible menopausal symptoms I hear about from so many people, are, are they inevitable? Cause I, I, I never had them, but I'm not bragging. I mean, I'm the opposite. I have cold flashes. I'm, I'm always cold. That's why I moved to the desert. So I don't know even what a hot flash <laughs> feels like, but they, they seem to be very troublesome for people. Yeah. You know, I was just saying that earlier. I said, it's not every woman that will be symptomatic. So, you know, in itself, we don't measure hormone level and there's no point necessarily of measuring them. It's really more uh, regarding your symptoms. So obviously I think that what happened, first of all, you got to realize that if you look at different country, you know, like Asian population, uh, J Japanese women, China, before they were on more of a diet like we are, um, we're not symptomatic of uh, hot flashes. 
So obviously it seems that there's some sort of a preparation of our body of having too much estrogen. And once that you get menopause and your system doesn't produce as much and the estrogen level substantially decrease, that is where we become so symptomatic of hot flashes. And yes, you're right. There's some women that will never uh, get it. Maybe your level of hormone was always kind of on the low side. And for you, it did not affect you as much as some other women, but some it's unbelievable how uncomfortable. And it's, it's it, the thing is that it has an impact on, you know, the way, you know, professional women, it's hard to go to meetings and then they have, they're anxious and they don't sleep as good. So it continuously degenerate with a lot of uh, um, how they, they feel and the well-being. So, so important. And, and I, it, it's good. Women are starting to talk and say, okay, something needs to be done. Um, so that's good that they take good care. You know, they, they want to take care of their health and we're there to help them. Fantastic. What, what impact do things like alcohol and coffee and high fat diets have on these types of symptoms? Uh, it, it all, like if we're talking about plant-based diet, so the high fat will substantially increase eventually, you know, uh, overweight and uh, inflammation so that when you, you know, get to menopause, eventually your estrogen, like I mentioned, will be high. Alcohol and uh, caffeine, it, it seems that for some people, there's some uh, element that trigger their hot flashes. So somebody will say, well, you know, I take a glass of wine and I have hot flashes. I mean, it's for any reason, some people will be a little bit more, um, you know, susceptible to the alcohol. Um, and you always have to tell them, well, I'm sorry, you may have to cut down a little bit on the alcohol. Uh, same thing with caffeine. It's not everybody, but if they say that it affects them. And so it's just the way it is. We're all different. Mm. So Linda says, I've been whole food plant-based for four years and recently diagnosed with estrogen positive cancer. A doctor mm. told me to avoid soy, flaxseed, chia seed, zucchini, and squash. I've heard about soy and flaxseed before, but what is the issue with zucchini and squash? I've never heard, if anything, I've heard those are foods you should have. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I don't know who that physician is, but I feel comfortable now that there's sufficient studies that have demonstrate that at least the vegetable, the zucchini and the soy, um, you know, is uh, actually one of those components that have minimal impact into the uh, estrogen, um, certainly not touching the estrogen receptor that you may have. So therefore, um, you know, continue looking at the literature and um, question a little bit more. Why is the onset of the period for girls happening younger and younger these days? Have you noticed that? Well, you guys should know by now because young women are exposed to a North American diet and their fat level is increased and therefore the estrogen level is present and stimulate the system to, you know, get the period earlier. That, that's what it is. You know, it's, it's a little too much of the food that change it. Yeah. Well, do you think the fact that cows are given mass doses of hormones have anything to do with it? And, and most people are drinking milk from the time they're little. Yeah. Well, I think it's, a, you know, it's part of the general um, condition, uh, the milk, absolutely. But it's part of all the North American, you know, I, I did not specifically said cow meal, but it's definitely include everything that we eat have a tendency to increase substantially the amount of fat um, and even carbs, the, the wrong carbs, unfortunately, the sugar can increase. And then, you know, being overweight uh, at this young age, which, you know, has definitely huge impact. So yeah, it's part of it. Absolutely. Are you still a runner? You know, I, I changed quite a bit. Uh, I was concerned I was getting too thin being a runner. So I walk more and I bike. I bike a lot. I travel. Uh, this has always been my way. Uh, so unfortunately with COVID, it has stopped it. But I usually go with uh, a group and go for two, three weeks in Europe and uh, United States, Canada, everywhere and um, use the bike. So I bike every day in the summertime. Now it's a little cool. So cross-country skiing in the winter more and downhill. Yeah. 
So you mentioned in, in everything you said, I put in the show notes and then the chat, you said you're licensed to treat non-Medicare patients in certain states, but if a Medicare patient wanted to pay out of pocket, you could see them, right? Well, you know, the Medicare does not allow people to, to uh, see us, even if we're non-Medicare, it's kind of the uh, craziness into all that because the, the, the business we have is a cash base anyway. Uh, but even if they are um, ready to pay and if they're Medicare, um, because of me, uh, for the moment, I did not, you know, this question that physician, we need to opt out of Medicare so we can see Medicare people. And I did not do it because so far I didn't know if I was going to practice again. And uh, got to be careful with that. So yeah, that's, that's a crazy situation, but that's what it is. Great. Thank you. Donna, who's watching live says, are vegan women more likely to get osteoporosis? I know there's been some studies about that. Uh, so, so the biggest thing that I have demonstrated is usually when they, they look at the different population between uh, vegan and non and, and typical diet is usually the people that, that are vegan have a lower BMI. So higher BMI being overweight on this, I'm not encouraging people to eat a regular diet just by a higher BMI, but it is to a certain extent a predictive factor. Uh, and that's why most of the studies had demonstrated that. Uh, there's still a lot of studies that are going on to try to obviously, if there's any place where the food industry wants to prove that we're wrong, is into the osteoporosis where they want to demonstrate that you have to have, you know, the calcium that are in the milk as opposed to, you know, lots of uh, um, difference in opinion. But once you remove and you put the same weight, uh, um, for, as an example, population in Asia uh, that um, are completely plant food based, their bone mass is better than ours. So obviously there's, there's something else um, that is uh, playing there. Yeah, that's something. I just saw a question. It was a good one too. My, my chat moves kind of, oh, here's one. Laura says, if someone hasn't been to a doctor in many years, what tests will offer the best measures of what's going on, such as inflammatory issues, mineral deficiencies, and overall health? I mean, you, you, you know, you say the first thing is to see people and see if they need to have extensive blood work. You got to be careful. You don't want to just throw uh, and do all the labs that, that exist. I think, uh, depending on the age, um, women that comes to see me, I certainly want to have a good idea of, uh, you know, their cholesterol, their, their, um, blood glucose, their, then, you know, we, we call it the metabolic, um, profile, which include the cell blood count, the, the, uh, um, um, I have a blank here and I have it in French and I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not going to say it right in the, the sodium potassium uh, uh, level. So there's some general, so the cholesterol is very important. What you want to, you know, being able to check if they have any elevated cholesterol, same thing for diabetes, inflammation, depending if they have any chronic disease, uh, then we can measure like the high sensitive protein C reactive. There's other elements that could be calculated and evaluated for information. But before I would do any of these larger testing, I wanna make sure that I see the people the prior to and make a decision together. So this is where it's so important to sit with people and not just say, I'm seeing you two minutes, here's the lab you go. That's not what I wanna do. When I see you and I have a good evaluation, then we make decision together of what's gonna be uh, the, the best, uh, you know, it's expensive. You can't just decide, you know, we're going to do all these tests, even if you have insurance. So just to make sure that we evaluate the right uh, testing, like as an example, woman over 65, I'm probably going to encourage to have a bone density uh, mammogram, big, big question for, for many, many years. So more after age 50 and even that, some uh, studies demonstrate that it may not be as good. So here we are, women that has always been thinking that mammogram was an important test. So things are changing. But again, it's really a personalized approach. What about pap smears once you're in your 60s? I mean, if you've always had a negative one, do we have to like keep going the rest of our life? I hate them. Yeah, the indication had been changed uh, significantly many years ago. 
Um, so if you've always, uh, now we do pap smear, especially if it's negative, no more than every five years. And after 65, uh, done. Done if you don't have any previous uh, history. Um, there's I never thought I'd be so happy to turn 65 in a few years because that means I get Medicare and no more pap smears. I'll celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to look forward to. I know that you're not practicing OBGYN or obstetrics right now, but do you think that it's become more difficult with the ever increasing obesity epidemic? Because does, isn't it more difficult when a woman is overweight and has a pregnancy and things like that? Absolutely. All the condition that you can see, um, um, you know, that complicated pregnancy, uh, gestational diabetes, uh, uh, preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure with uh, um, pregnancy, difficult delivery, higher risk of uh, complication during cesarean section, um, larger baby, uh, many, many uh, of the uh, risk related to uh, obstetrics are often amplified significantly uh, in relationship with uh, um, overweight and, and sometimes it's not even overweight, just the fact that they don't eat the right thing, the inflammation uh, that it's causing has an impact and, and put them at higher risk of some of these conditions. Right. Thanks. Uh, Vicki says, are there any natural remedies or treatments to help shrink fibroids? I've heard of one, water fasting. <laughs> what, you know, so fibroids are, are, um, it's a little growth that you have on uh, your uterus. Um, and uh, women that has a higher level of estrogen will have a higher risk of having, you know, those fibroids. They could be very, very tiny and not necessarily having any significant impact. They could be pretty large as well. And usually, or they're gonna be large and cause some significant discomfort, or they're gonna cause some significant bleeding. I just wanted to throw it out there so people know what it is. So therefore, if you also go on the plant food-based diet, what are you doing? Plant-based diet is an anti-inflammatory uh, diet. And by taking an anti-inflammatory diet, you substantially decrease your level of estrogen and therefore you're helping with the fibroid. Now, again, you always have to be careful. If you're talking about a huge fibroid, plant-based may not be as helpful but smaller ones that are barely causing problem, um, they can do pretty good. Wow, that's fantastic. What about painful periods? And what causes them? And will a plant-based diet help people that have dysmenorrhea? Absolutely. So dysmenorrhea is caused, painful period, is caused by an element inside the uh, uterus that, uh, you know, every time that we have our period is what we call and I may not say it well in English, it's prostaglandin. So the prostaglandin are the reason of causing the, the pain. And prostaglandin are usually stimulated by higher level of estrogen. So, you know, the plant-based uh, diet will have a substantially uh, impact on reducing the pain. I've seen it very well. And if not, um, you know, I try to make sure that people understand that prostaglandin, an anti-prostaglandin could be uh, used, which is something like uh, ibuprofen starting um, a day uh, before their period. But ideally, I prefer to insist and encourage them to, um, you know, change their diets and so that they can see the impact. So it's all these things could be substantially changed with a, a whole plant-based diet. Oh, all good question, all related to my field. So that's perfect. Oh, no, well, that's right. Because we, we send out in a week in advance who's going to be on the show so that, that they can. Ah, so they know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And then some people are also asking questions live. What do you like best about working for plant-based telehealth? Uh, you know, first of all, the group, the group of physicians. Uh, I've never seen such a, a unique group that really wants to, um, we're all hoping the same thing. We want to help the people to improve their health. So that that's pretty amazing to feel um, so, um, so welcome every time we have a meeting. Um, and, um, you know, the amazing thing for me is now I can see people from different states. I wish I was, um, you know, United States would allow me to see people all over the state because I can be at home and or in an office and being able to talk to somebody who's in uh, California, uh, somewhere in Canada, somewhere in, in 
Iceland. <laughs> this is what it's so amazing. Uh, and, uh, and they're doing an amazing job. I have to admit to uh, start marketing, but giving us the chance to participate in a podcast like you, just to give the word out there to say, here we are. Uh, this is what we're doing and we want to help you to uh, improve your health. And again, I think that's so important to make them realize that it's not just health, it's really optimal health. We want to optimize um, to make sure that, uh, you know, you uh, feel good. Wow. And you can do it in your pajama bottoms too. I'm not going to show you what I have in bottom. <laughs> people, if people only knew what I, how I was dressed from the bottom down for this last year and a half, they would <laughs> Slippers and you know, uh, especially in the summer. The summer is like short and uh, but hey, and I mean for today I just want to. We don't see it, but that's my shirt of plant based oh, stuff. I so I just wanted that. to. Uh, Since you guys, are, you guys are in all different states, how are you going to have a Christmas party? Well, you know that's the only biggest disadvantage. We cannot be together, but we already uh, like today. We had a uh, you know we're starting having a webinar for the. Um, you know, people that just like you want to be present. So we talk already of, you know, what is it that we could be eating during uh, the uh, Christmas time uh, just to help people. So we'll uh, probably just chat online and uh, that's just the way we have to adapt with the situation. That's Hopefully fun. one day I can see them face to face. That would be fun. Maybe at a conference, who knows? Uh, Tracy, who's watching live says, my 30 year old daughter only gets two to four periods a year since she started at age 17. She's changed to a plant-based diet for six months and it hasn't changed. Yeah, well, you know, that depends also. It's important to be able to see the individual. So some people miss their period because they're too thin. Like as an example, the extreme is usually a gymnast will often will have their period or, or overweight. So that makes it so that the ovulation, you know, what your ovary produce every month is ovulation. And it's a, it's a perfect orchestrated system to allow to have a period every month. And when you're a little bit overweight, you know, it disturbed this signal so that when you have your period, it's usually disorganized. It's not followed by a normal ovulation. It's usually by, you know, suddenly there's a lot of hormones and then the inside lining that allow us to have a period suddenly gets so much that you have a, a period. So it's a disorganized period. But eventually by sticking to a, a plant base, if the weight change, uh, inflammation decrease, eventually, hopefully she will return to a normal um, period pattern. Great. Thanks. Well, I don't know if you've ever watched the show, Dr. Fontaine, but the most popular question for just about every guest is what do you eat in a day? Ah, so uh, in the morning, um, I will eat uh, oatmeal and uh, I'm going to put some uh, blueberry, raspberry and nuts, a little bit of maple syrup. I'm a maple syrup girl. But you're um, from Canada. You have to. It's like it's, that's that's one thing. That's one thing I love, maple syrup. And then I'll have a whole, uh, my husband does make amazing bread. Um, so bread with, uh, I'll, I'll have a little bit of peanut butter and a banana. I usually have that for breakfast. For lunch, uh, it's going to be a mix, you know, I'm just going to, so I made the other day uh, sweet potato with um, uh, tempeh, uh, red onion and turmeric um, and paprika. I just like those different spice. Uh, and I, I mix it with rice and salad. So I'm, I'm one of those that just go out and look at what's available and just mix and make something that, you know, it's going to be full of uh, what I uh, what I like. Uh, and then for dinner, it will depend, you know, it's like tonight, most likely a huge salad with lots of um, leafy green vegetable and, um, you know, uh, sometimes quinoa, mix it with, with rice and different grains. And in the winter, when, when it becomes a little cool in Vermont, I would have a tendency to make a lot of uh, amazing soup where I put all the vegetable that I have left inside my, uh, you know, fridge or a chili. I totally love those uh, bean chili. That's just uh, amazing. So just a little example of what I do. Do you use the Instant Pot? Yes, yes. Yes, it's very efficient. I really like it. Uh, uh, but, you know, on, on enough. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. 
Oh, there's a question. What are your favorite kitchen gadgets? My, oh, I love those, um, the small processor. I, I love learning, cutting. I really have good knife and I've, um, you know, take time to learn the technique so that I uh, don't lose it. But I love the, um, uh, the, the very small processor, not the big one, so that when I have, I'm making my food, I can just drop into it and make my onion, my garlic, my vegetable being ready so that, you know, if you want to do a, a, a vegan spaghetti sauce, it doesn't take forever to cut all your vegetable. So that's what, that's, that's my preferred one. I call, I call it Oscar. Oh, nice. You know, here's a question I can't answer as a doctor, but I actually can answer it as a patient. And then you'll tell me your thoughts from Trent. My wife who is turning 51, never had children and is generally perfect in all aspects, has terrible period headaches that can take her down for two or more days, usually at the beginning, sometimes at the end, any suggestions? I had that in my forties and they did a procedure called an ablation. And I loved it because I never got another period and I never got another headache. Yeah, I did a lot of ablation. Uh, it was, you know, obviously I'm an old physician. So it started into my practice when I, I don't know, had practiced maybe 20 years before it came in. Um, it, it's interesting that it would touch the headache, but, you know, it all depends how you feel. Um, it, uh, lots of time of use is to help with the significant bleeding. Um, and the hormones are hormones that have a significant impact. So at 51, you would think that the majority of women hit menopause around uh, 51. So she should uh, see a, an improvement pretty soon. And I don't know if she's whole plant based, but it's not a bad time to help her with that as well. Um, let's see if he says she is. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Trent, if you're still there, it, well, what's her diet like? So, yeah. Interesting. So very cool. Uh, look at that. How many, uh, I, I think that this person must have came in late because they're asking how many pounds you lost on the plant-based diet. You were already slender. I think before you started, you said. Correct. So, so I'm, a, I'm a boring one. Yeah. It must be nice. Like my husband, you can't relate to the rest of the world. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Well, it's such a pleasure getting to know you, or as they say in France, enchanté de faire votre connaissance, my accent. Uh, moi de même, ce fut un plaisir d'être uh, à votre émission. There's nothing more sexy and beautiful than a French accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, well thank, you, thank you so much, Dr. Fontaine. And oh, my pleasure. If you live Thank in one of the four states, you can see her virtually. And if you live in a different state, she has lots of colleagues at Plant-Based Telehealth because they're certified in every state, at least some of the doctors are. I know Dr. Marvis, I think, is all of the states. Thanks so right. much for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 2 p.m. Pacific time when my guest is Nick DeVorn from Local Spicery, and he's going to be making sauces. Take care, Dr. Fontaine. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.